Welcome everyone to today's episode of CEO Series, a program by the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center which draws on the insights of top chief executives shaping the future of energy, climate, and advanced technologies. I'm Fred Kemp, I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by Francois Poirier, uh, the President and Chief Executive Officer of TC Energy, a North American energy company based out of Calgary, Alberta. TC Energy operates nearly 90 billion US dollars worth of energy assets in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. As the global energy market experiences uh, unprecedented turbulence in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, learning from uh, the experience of experts actually operating energy systems has never been uh, more important. And that's why we make a point of bringing together uh, public sector leaders and private sector le leaders like Francois uh, to talk with each other and to better inform you and, and, and that is just one of many reasons why I'm uh, delighted to be joined by him. Before we jump in, I'd like to remind our audience that today's conversation is public and on the record, streaming live over Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and the Atlantic Council website. You can follow along over Twitter using the handles at Atlantic Council and at AC Global Energy with the hashtag AC Energy, hashtag AC Energy. If you want to ask a question during the uh, question and answer section at the end of today's conversation, please use the Q&A function over Zoom. If you're not watching us over Zoom, I'm, I'm sorry that we're not gonna be able to take your questions uh, for this event. And with that, let's get started. Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fred. And it's great to be here at the Atlantic Council, especially at such a pivotal time when our world continues to experience evolving social expectations, tumultuous geopolitical events, and global supply chain disruptions, the need for reliable energy supply has never been greater. Demand is growing, but also with it, the expectation that energy is delivered with the lowest emissions profile possible. Countries are struggling to maintain a balance of providing reliable energy supply while tackling emissions. But this is a challenge that unites us. Simply put, transitioning too quickly creates energy instability, but so too does ignoring critical energy system planning considerations such as clean technology maturation and viability, such as hydrogen and renewables. System safeguards like decades old mantra of ensuring diversity of energy sources, supplies, and routes. Or ensuring energy systems are shielded from hyper politicization like in the nuclear industry. Take Germany, for example, which now relies on 20 coal fired power plants. Germany's actions are indicative of what's happening across the world. Nations are reconsidering energy systems and supply chains. And while many nations default to dirtier energy sources, others seek to leapfrog forward a wholly redesigned energy system. We witnessed this again in the recent G7 Climate, Energy, and Environment Ministers meeting. In both instances, the immediate next steps were missing. There's a need for secure, and affordable energy, and it is colliding with emissions reduction efforts. Under our current energy crisis scenario, there is a perceived trade-off between economic and national security on the one hand, and emissions reductions on the other. The correct action is to embark on a path of sustainable progress, a path that delivers secure, affordable, and clean energy to the world. This is why we believe in an all of the above energy solution and why we need cross-border North American collaboration on innovation. As a North American company, we have a unique vantage point. We see an unprecedented opportunity for our three countries 
and economies to work together. We can leverage our common energy assets to unlock reliable, affordable, and sustainable energy across North America and bring it to the world. Today, it's, I'd like to share our vision for North American energy, a vision backed by our 70-year history of delivering energy and our 7,000 energy problem solvers across North America. Our world-class infrastructure transports more than 25% of the natural gas consumed in North America. It delivers energy over 3,000 miles for our crude oil pipelines connecting oil from Alberta to refineries in the U.S. And we generate enough electricity to power 4 million homes, more than 75% of which is carbon-free, including our nuclear assets. In the U.S., we move approximately 30% of the country's LNG feed gas to reach global markets. TC Energy is the only gas transmission company that operates in all three company, countries of North America. And this gives us a distinct understanding of the region's opportunities and challenges and the solutions that will drive progress. Starting with policy, we must identify ways to shape regulatory policies around common goals that enhance cross-border coordination so that we can leverage our shared expertise and experience, harness energy resources for economic growth, strengthen supply chains, and adopt common standards to promote responsible growth. We have an opportunity to coordinate and complement each other's efforts to infrastructure modernization and development while honoring national sovereignty and country priorities. Together we can develop North American energy solutions by investing in research and development, sharing findings and best practices, building regional value chains that leverage each, company, each country's strength, focusing on inno innovative technologies that reduce emissions regardless of energy type, and also leveraging the distinct characteristics and resources of each country to achieve emissions reductions goals without compromising energy security. North America is where the solutions and innovation will happen. Innovating and deploying together, we can bring North American energy abundance to the world. Without our shared leadership, other countries will continue to rely on coal and other higher emitting energy sources. North America has the potential to be a global clean energy powerhouse. We have the immediate solution to address the global challenges of energy security and emissions reductions. But to get there, we must work in partnership to increase the needed infrastructure to export more North American LNG to deploy small-scale LNG technologies to support emissions reductions for smaller countries, to share emissions reductions technologies developed in North America with the rest of the world, and address production and deployment challenges with nuclear power and integrate this solution into emission reductions. The US and North America can meet rising global demand for clean energy resources and technologies. Governments, industry, and academic institutions should work together to capitalize on its collective strengths and implement a regional energy strategy. We will set the gold standard for energy security and emissions reduction, working together as one continent to make global ener clean energy transition possible. And it won't be easy, but nothing meaningful ever is. So I'm very excited by the possibility and believe that North America can secure the world's energy future by coming together. Thank you. Um. Francois Poirier, uh, that was really fantastic and really set the stage Thank extremely you. well for the conversation that will now follow. Um, 
a challenge that unites us. Uh, you know, uh, in, you know, if we go uh, too fast, we could create instability. If we go too slow, we could create instability. Talking from your vantage point of a company of 70 years, 7,000 people with the reach that you have, with 25% of natural gas consumed, that, that's just a terrific kickoff. And talking about North America, uh, America as a potential to be pe potential of a global clean energy powerhouse. Uh, so, um, as your focus was so much on uh, where you're operating, uh, North America, Mexico, Canada, the U.S., I'm going to start by trying to put this in its global context. Uh, it's you know, we all know what we faced last winter, uh, particularly in Europe. Uh, because of the war in Ukraine, because of Russia's continued uh, execution of that war. Um, and we got lucky. Uh, you know, uh, China uh, consumption went down, freeing up some LNG deliveries. Uh, it was a warm winter. Um, uh, you know, we're now going to have the resurgence of energy demand in East Asia, particularly China. We may not have another warm winter. Uh, there's a need to ensure energy access in Africa and developing Asia. So you talked about the role of North America as a global, uh, you know, uh, global power in this. But how does what role can North America play to make sure that there's a secure, stable, and accessible energy system overseas and globally? That's a great question, Fred. Um, and frankly, without exporting more natural gas to places like India uh, and Asia and other developing countries. Um, we are simply not going to be able to reduce the world's emissions uh, in any you know, material, material way. I think permitting reform is very important. Uh, innovation, as I talked about, sharing knowledge and, and having common regulatory standards amongst the three countries in North America. In essence, bringing forth collaboration amongst Canada, the U.S., and Mexico will help ensure that we maximize the export or the movement of natural gas to the coasts of North America and therefore make it accessible to the world. Because it's very clear to me that in the near term, the best solution to addressing and balancing energy affordability, energy reliability, and sustainability is through making natural gas accessible to those parts of the world who currently rely on oil and coal for their primary source of energy supply. Uh, and, and if you look, I'm going to go back and forth between my questions and also audience questions. So I uh, urge all of you out there to send in your questions. Because you're talking about LNG, Mark Zashin has asked a question. Actually, Mark Zashin has asked several questions. But let me pick on one of them here first. Uh, which is uh, where does uh, where does your company CC Energy see the use of LNG or floating LNG going forward? We saw last year was an interesting pivot point. Yes. But is this the sustainable world we're seeing? Uh, what is your what is your prediction for the way forward for LNG? Well, I certainly see uh, a need for floating LNG. It's an it's a way for. Uh, to bring flexibility to the location and um, the ability to deliver liquefaction uh, capacity uh, in relatively short order. However, I do believe that um, the need for LNG around the world will grow significantly over the next 10 to 20 years. And we're going to need more, not only floating LNG, but more um, shoreline facilities as well uh, to meet the world's demand. And so working backwards from the point of demand to the point of um, liquefaction and then to the point of production, um, pipelines will become very critical in that supply chain to ensure that there's uh, sufficient supply to, uh, to meet the world's demand. And do we have enough LNG supply right now? As I said last year, the Chinese, to a certain extent, let Europe off the hook. Uh, Europe moved much faster than anyone could have imagined in terms of creating LNG facilities. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, if, if you, you're right, we have to create all this, but at the moment without having created, is, is it sufficient? Uh, I'm concerned. Yeah. I think we were 
lucky last year, and you know, luck isn't a strategy. Um, and um, with uh, natural gas demand um, growing in China, with uh, China Chinese market ex, uh, you know exiting COVID, and uh, we had a very mild winter in Europe last last year, and uh, we were very fortunate for that to happen. And we're certainly not hoping for a cold winter uh, this year uh, for the sake of um, the human impacts. But we need to be prepared for a colder winter. And uh, we're very concerned about um, how tight supply will get should the Chinese economy continue to um, grow its demand as well as, um, as weather-driven demand in Europe. So I, 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 love, um, I love that quote statement, lucky isn't a strategy. Uh, I, I think that's, those are words one can live by. So uh, we talk a lot uh, here at the Atlantic Council about the energy trilemma. Yes. And it's balancing, and you talked about this in your opening remarks uh, very effectively, about this balance between security, affordability, and sustainability. And I think before the war in Ukraine, I think we'd almost, uh, you know, Dan Jurgen, the great energy expert, talked about that we got some amnesia about uh, energy security. We forgot about energy security. Now the energy security is there again. How does the idea uh, of an energy transition impact how you balance these three pillars of the trilemma? Well, Fred, it's certainly the case that uh, energy security has been brought back into the conversation in a much more prominent way, which I think is, is quite realistic. Look, from my perspective, there are two policy approaches to encouraging investment um, in new energies. The first is what I would call energy reduction. And this is what I believe Germany undertook. They wanted to incent the development of lower emitting forms of energy like wind and solar um, by eliminating the supply of nuclear. They uh, shut down the vast majority of their nuclear plants and by mothballing the majority of their coal plants as well. What they did by doing that is they increased their dependency on natural gas supply for an indefinite period of time um, with one supplier and in fact a supplier with um, geopolitical aims. The other way to proceed uh, to address the energy trilemma is through what I call energy addition and emissions reduction. And that's more of an all of the above approach. Um, I think what, the, uh, what Germany taught us is that you can create price shocks and you can actually create significantly higher emissions through an approach of energy reduction. Energy addition ensures affordability, reliability, and sustainability. So for us at TC Energy, we have a $34 billion uh, committed backlog of investments. And for us, that means an all of the above approach. 80% um, of our capital is devoted to expanding our natural gas infrastructure, driven predominantly by coal to gas fire generation conversions in the US, as well as exports of LNG to the world. And we have investments in nuclear, um, wind and solar, as well as um, carbon capture and storage, renewable natural gas, and hydrogen, because we do feel it's important for us to understand new energy technologies to the extent they become affordable, reliable, and sustainable in the future. So let, let me, um, uh, in, in, in an energy, uh, conversation, I always hesitate to say, let me drill down on that. But, uh, but uh, uh, Mark Zashin has asked something that would follow up on your last statement, which is what of the areas of renewable energy you've cited, uh, which do you think are going to benefit your company most? Where are you putting your biggest bet? And he'd also uh, like you to go a little bit further on nuclear and where you stand there. Yes. And I'll start with nuclear because um, we are very big fans. I believe there's a significant role for nuclear to play in the future. If you look at CO2 emissions from high heat industrial processes around the world, that makes up 10% of the globe's emissions. Emissions that come from dry, driving vehicles is 6%. 
emissions that come from the airline industry is 2%. So if we can address um, emissions from industrial processes, we would actually make significant progress. What's great about nuclear technology is modern nuclear plants have an ability to deliver steam at very high temperatures and thereby is quite applicable to a number of industrial processes. So I do believe that nuclear will continue to play a role. Uh, we happen to own half of the largest operating nuclear plant in the world. It is based in Ontario, Canada. It's called Bruce Power. And we're undertaking um, over the next 10 years or so a, a um, $12 billion uh, life extension program to extend those reactors by 40 years. As to the other areas, we do believe that there is a role for wind and solar in, in energy systems. And um, when you talk about wind and solar, then you start to think about what are the firming resources that are necessary in order to make them reliable. So we're looking at uh, lithium ion battery investments. But one of the oldest technologies and most prominent technologies, Fred, for electricity storage is pumped hydro. Over 90% of the world's storage of electricity is, is in the form of pumped hydro. And we at TC Energy happen to have two projects under development. One relatively small one in Alberta for 75 megawatts and a very large one in Ontario for 1,000 megawatts um, that would deliver 10 to 12 hours uh, of duration. But for the uninitiated in our audience, we have a very expert audience, but we also have people who are just really interested and are tuning in. Pumped hydro, can you define that for people? By all means. So during the day, you've got water at a reservoir at higher elevation, mm. and you run the water downhill through a water turbine, thereby generating power. And then in the evening, you, uh, when electricity is plentiful and at a much lower cost, you pump the water back up the hill to the reservoir. Mm. So it's a technology that's been around for 100 years. Assets, uh, pumped hydro assets can last. They have a life of 100 years. Mm. Zero emissions and uh, very flexible to help manage what will be in the future with decentralized uh, renewable generation, a much more complex transmission grid. Fascinating, sorry, I think I interrupted you. No, not at all. Yep. Uh, I think the other areas that we find very interesting, carbon capture, uh, transportation and sequestration. Um, it is the means by which the oil and gas industry must make itself more carbon competitive. If the oil and gas sector wants to have a role to play long term in energy systems, um, it must embrace carbon capture and storage. We are interested in participating in the transportation and sequestration portion of that value chain and have a number of, of projects underway. And then lastly, I'd say on the hydrogen. We see a huge potential for hydrogen in hard to abate sectors like heavy duty transportation, um, transport trucks, for example, where um, the service that, um, and the quality of the trucks is actually a much more a much safer and much more pleasant experience for the drivers. It's cost competitive today with the subsidies that are available. And of course, um, if, uh, if the hydrogen that's produced is green hydrogen, the entire value chain has zero emissions. You really mean it when you talk about all of the above. Oh yes, uh, very uh, much so. Uh, we have a question here from Paul Sullivan. Um, and I think this refers to your company. I, I think that's what's suggested here. Uh, which, of course, we've talked about North America, we've talked about Canada and Mexico and, uh, and the United States. The question here is, would it not also be also good to cooperate on such issues with nations outside of North America on R&D, investments, policy developments, regulatory thinking, and educating the public on what is needed? Possibilities, question mark, Japan, Australia, Germany, the UK and such. How are you thinking? Uh, and operating uh, uh, beyond uh, the, these three large markets we've talked about. I completely agree with that. Uh, and as I believe I referenced in my prepared remarks, it's important to share our experiences with, with developing markets. Not only do I believe that coordination between Canada, the US and Mexico can make North America more successful, but I do believe that North America can play a role in making 
uh, the world's energy systems more affordable, reliable, and sustainable. And part of that is going to come through um, sharing knowledge on those technologies. And um, we have a number of different partnerships with global, global firms that would help us do that. We have so many fascinating questions here, and we've got about four or five minutes left. Uh, so let me pick a couple of these. Uh, one viewer would like you to go into more detail on the car your carbon capture plans. Another uh, would like to know whether it's fair that European oil companies complain they are held to higher renewable standards than U.S. counterparts, and of course, Canadian counterparts, let's put under there as well. Yes. Uh, what is your view on those two questions? So on, on carbon capture, um, there's a very interesting opportunity for us at scale in Alberta, Canada. And the reason for that is that um, the point of emission and therefore capture uh, is co-located with the pore space. So Alberta has excellent pore space to sequester CO2 once it's been captured. And because it's co-located, it's very cost efficient for us to build uh, a system at scale. So we've partnered with another pipeline company named Pembina to develop what's called the Alberta Carbon Grid. It is intended to be a common carrier system and uh, ultimately at its full uh, capacity will be able to transport and sequester 20 million tons per year, which is about 25% of the emissions in the province of Alberta. There are more issues uh, with the primacy of um, oversight on pore space in the United States between uh, the individual states and the federal government uh, than in Canada where it's very clear. So we expect to be investing first in Canada. We do have projects we're developing in North Dakota, for example, one of the few states where that the primacy of state oversight is very clear. Uh, to sequester CO2 emissions from a coal plant, for example. We're working with a few companies on that. So it is a, um, a technology we're very excited about, and it will not only help reduce the world's emissions, but it'll help um, uh, our oil and gas producing customers um, to remain competitive and relevant. So I often like to uh, close fascinating conversations like this uh, with the question that I ask not just chief executives, leading chief executives in energy, but really in any number of fields, which is looking out at this year and beyond, what gives you in the, your space the most hope and what gives you the biggest concern, the thing that keeps you awake at night? Yes. The most hope I have is because of our company's competitive position, um, you know, we have... Uh, pipelines in most of the provinces of Canada. We're in 38 states in the U.S. Uh, and um, in many, pro many states in Mexico. Uh, we're the only gas transmission company that is actually in, each, in all of the three countries. But because we have 40 years of experience in power generation, we understand the intersection between the electron and the gas molecule. Mm -hmm. And as economies look to decarbonize over the next decade, Primarily, they'll be looking to do that through electrification. And we understand both sides of the ledger, if you will. So that is what um, makes me feel like we have a sustainable competitive advantage. What concerns me is availability of talent. Uh, it is, there's a war on talent out there, and we are competing not only with other energy infrastructure companies, we're competing with technology companies. You know, innovation is such an important part of our... Um, strategic and creative process now that uh, uh, finding the best people and retaining the best people is going to be a big challenge for companies across, uh, across this industry. I think that's a rich place to end because it's not just across this industry, it's across almost all industries. Where's the talent yeah. uh, in, in, in a situation changing, changing so quickly? So unfortunately, our time uh, is coming to a close. I want to thank the uh, virtual audience, which engaged with us in such a lively manner. Uh, thank you to Francois Poirier uh, for um, joining us and sharing your vision uh, in this engaging conversation. Uh, I, I want to thank everybody at the, the Global Energy Center, uh, 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 Dick Morningstar, the founder and chairman, uh, Landon Durance, the senior director, 
uh, and Reed Blakemore, uh, just an incredible team we have working on these really, as you said, complicated issues every day. A recording of this conversation will be available on the Atlantic Council web, state, web, web page after the event, so you'll be able to look at it again and use it again. Uh, please keep attending these events uh, until, until then. Take care to all of you. And thank you so much, Francois, for this fascinating conversation. Thank you, Fred.